Avoid these five things to make your ambient mixes and masters sound their best. I'm an ambient and experimental artist just like you, and I know that it can be really hard to mix the kind of music that we make because it doesn't really fit into any specific genre. A lot of the stuff that we're doing is very unique, and so it can feel very hard to put all these elements together in a way that sounds professional. But I think if we look at other genres, there are a lot of things that we can take from them. So today I'm focusing on what I think are the five most common mistakes in ambient and experimental music that we should avoid to make our mixes and masters sound their best. Before we get into it, please don't forget to check the links in the description for my free resources. There is a $0 mastering chain guide. There is a guide to getting more sales and followers on Bandcamp. You can request a free one track master sample from me and lots more. All right, let's get to it. Number one, not checking stereo width. Look, ambient is supposed to sound big and lush, and that's why we need to make sure that when we play it back on speakers, that all of that gets captured by the speakers. But if things are too wide, you're gonna end up with phase cancellation, and a lot of that beautiful ambience is gonna disappear. Unless you're sitting in a perfect triangle, if your music is wide enough that it goes into antiphase, then it's going to cancel out any of those frequencies when you're listening to them in a room. The fix is to use a stereo image monitoring tool such as the Ozone Imager to make sure you're looking at how wide your mix is and then using stereo width manipulation tools to make sure that your overall mix or your master isn't going into antiphase. Number two, not putting anything in the center of the image. I've listened to so many ambient tracks where everything is out here. And it's lovely, it's a beautiful big pillow, and if this is your intention, that's fine. But it sounds to me like a bit of a mushy mess. I want something to focus on. And so if we put just one thing, it doesn't need to be loud, it can be quiet in the mix, but if you put it in the center, your brain will just naturally gravitate towards it and it will act as an anchor point for all the rest of the things that are happening in your music. So the fix here is just to pick one instrument and put it dead in the center. It can be as quiet as you like, as long as it is in the center. Number three, mixing pads together with super dynamic material. If you're mixing pads or drones with something that is really dynamic, so for example, field recordings, anything made using music concrete, even things like vocals, if you're not compressing those items, it makes it really hard to glue them together because the dynamic ranges of them are very, very different. So in the mastering phase, I need to use quite a lot of compression to get everything to match. And if you know anything about mastering, you'll know that too much of anything is usually not a good sign. So we wanna make sure that we compress those items down when we're in the mixing phase so that they blend in a lot better with those less dynamic things like pads. And then they'll sit much better in the mix. Number four, mixing too dark or too bright. If you're mixing too dark, you might be mixing at too high of a volume. And if you're mixing too bright, it might mean that you're mixing at too low of a volume. This is because our ears perceive different parts of the audio spectrum differently, refer to the Fletcher Munson curves. So if you're mixing too loud, your ears will perceive the top end as being too harsh and then you'll turn it down, which will result in an overall darker sounding mix. And if you're mixing too quiet, you'll feel like you can't hear the top end enough and so you'll bring it up. The fix is to choose a consistent volume and stick to it when you're mixing. Check out my video up here about mixing to a consistent volume and also don't forget to use references. And number five, recording in one take directly to stereo from hardware. Even if you are fantastic at mixing in outboard gear, if you're mixing straight down to stereo, it means that you can't make any changes to that mix once it's done. If it comes to a mastering engineer and they find issues, there's no way to fix it without re-recording the whole thing. So this compounds all of the previous issues I mentioned in this video. If you're serious about recording, I recommend getting either a multi-input USB interface, or if you're on modular, a multi-output interface so that you can make sure you can record everything directly to multi-track so that you can change your mix after you've recorded it. If there's another instrument that you've been hankering after recently, perhaps just put that off a little bit and go buy one of those and it'll give you a lot more value in the long run. If you think I've missed anything, if you think I'm wrong, throw it in the comments, I'd love to chat. Please don't forget to check out my free resources, link in the description. You can also request a free master sample done by me. If you found this valuable, I'd really appreciate it if you liked the video and maybe even subscribed. 
If you didn't catch it earlier on, please check out this video, which is about how to get a more consistent sound when you're mixing and mastering. And until next time, keep making music. Cheers.